morning, everyone. Hope everyone is enjoying this beautiful start to the day. We had an elk right behind our cabin that said a nice hello to us this morning. I'm Natalie Sexton. I head up our Human Dimensions branch with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, I'm very excited to be a co-host of this conference this year. And uh, we just finished some uh, Human Dimensions training uh, before this conference started and I'm very inspired and, and re-energized as our agency continues to integrate social science into our conservation work. Uh, I wanted to um, just give a recognition to uh, the other uh, sponsors and uh, supporters of this conference, obviously Colorado State as the lead and uh, we have uh, the Organization of Wildlife Planners, Bots Bieber Institute, Ohio State University, and Kansas State University. So much appreciation for all of those sponsors that have helped to make that successful. Um, I would like to uh, have a couple of uh, important announcements, program corrections that I think you guys will want to know about. Uh, it's regarding the understanding the connections between human and wildlife, the special session in tribute to Dr. Stephen Keller. So there's some changes to the description of that program, but more importantly, there's some changes to the agenda for that program that really goes uh, all day today, starting at about 10 o'clock. So if you're relying on the online program, it is correct. Uh, if you have the printed program, uh, there's some, um, there's some um, mistakes in there and you can get hard copies uh, out here in this building. They've got hard copies so you can make sure that you know what's going on with that program. So first up today, I'd like to, uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're just getting going on this conference, but we always got to be thinking about where we're heading next and I'm going to uh, turn it over to I, uh, Von Ruschkowski, and he is the uh, director of Northern Germany's Nature Conservation Training, Training Center. And they're going to be the local host of the Pathways 2018, which will be taking place in Europe. So Ike, would you like to tell us what we have to look forward to there? Thank you, Natalie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I was about to say the same that you realize Pathways has always been cutting edge and will be because even before we start this year's conference, we're talking about the next one. So I guess uh, for next year, uh, you have a selection or a choice of either going to Namibia in January, right? Or to make it out to Germany in exactly a year from now, uh, where will we be hosting uh, pathways in Europe for the first time. Um, it will be hosted in Goslar in Germany. I will tell you about it in a minute where this is exactly located. And as a theme, we have selected Resurrecting the Wild Solutions for Human Wildlife Coexistence and European Landscape Diversity. So obviously for the theme, for those of you who are not familiar with the situation in Europe, there's a number of species that have made a remar remarkable recovery over the past two decades or so, and they do not only include the large carnivores we usually like to talk about, but also uh, herbivores like the beaver, or birds like the cormorant, which all bring with them, by extending their range, a huge confl conflict potential. So we want to look into all these different uh, conflict potentials and how to find solutions for the diversity of landscapes we have in Europe and also the diversity of the different countries we have within the EU, which doesn't mean that we will all only be restricted to European topics, but uh, I guess we'll try to actually bring people together from Europe because a lot of research in terms of uh, human wildlife conflicts that is being done in Europe is not labeled under the term human dimensions. So you'll find a lot of people who are, I wouldn't say who are isolated, but they're just uh, individuals working in different countries, different institutions, and we'll try to bring them together for the first time. And for this specific matter, we're also collaborating closely with the European Commission, because of course the uh, Commission has an interest 
with uh, nature legislation Europe being implemented that the amount of conflicts is actually uh, being reduced. So, where's Goslar? Um, it's a small town, actually. Uh, I didn't Google the number of inhabitants, maybe 40,000 or so. But the nice thing about Goslar is it's a city that has a more than 3,000 years uh, history. Um, it used to be uh, when Germany didn't exist as, as it does today. So uh, 500 years ago, it used to be the emperor's seat, actually. So there's still an emperor's palace. Uh, the whole town of Goslar is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, a cut in combination of Goslar's old town, um, the historic emperor's castle, and uh, a mining site that has been an iron ore mine for more than 3,000 years. Uh, in addition, Goslar is located next to Harz National Park, which is uh, one of the German mid-mountain ranges national parks um, that used to uh, include also the former Iron Curtain. So uh, one of the field trips, of course, we'll offer is to uh, take a hike along the former Iron Curtain between West and East Germany. And uh, Harz National Park has also reintroduced the Eurasian lynx as uh, its icon species. Uh, about 15 years ago, so uh, we'll hear about uh, their success of this program and also all the conflicts uh, involved with this. Um, if you look on a map, I'm not sure how much you can see in the very back. So basically what you need to remember is Goslar is in northern Germany, um, Hanover is the closest, largest city with a major airport to it. it, takes about an hour to an hour and a half to get there, and uh, once you're in Goslar, as the venue, we've picked a hotel, which is, uh, uh, if you can see the hotel's name, the Achtermann there on that tower, this is actually one of the towers of the medieval city walls, so the building itself is partially more than 500 years old. So aside from uh, being surrounded by nature, we also figured that uh, some cultural heritage might be suit, uh, well suiting for this conference. And if you are, Tired of the conference after a long day, this hotel also includes a spa area. So uh, um, I'm just saying this because I cannot guarantee for weather as nice as it is here at this time of the year. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll have a lot of sunshine, but it's the first inland mountain range uh, from the coast uh, towards inland Germany. So sometimes we do have rain, so bring a bathing suit and a raincoat. Um, other than that, uh, we have the first preliminary website up and running. Um, if you want to take note of the uh, email address I put there, that's for the initial um, contact you can make. So we put you on our email distribution list. And uh, other than that, I'm still currently uh, in negotiations with potential other partners, uh, also from an NGO perspective. Um, so we're trying to bring scientists, practitioners, and stakeholders together for this conference next year. And I hope to see as many of you there uh, in September of 2018. And in case you have any questions, uh, I'll be around here for the whole conference. So just uh, talk to me and I'll try to answer your questions as much as I can. Thank you. So bathing suits and a raincoat. Alex, that sounds really interesting and exciting, and the pictures were really, really great. And um, what a what a neat uh, venue and opportunity to uh, be taking taking the Pathways uh, Conference t to Europe. So I really look forward to hearing more about that. So I have the distinct pleasure now to introduce our plenary speaker for the morning, Dr. Lori Marker, and she uh, is uh, established the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So just wanted to tell you a little bit about Lori. I'd encourage you to read her bio, her very accomplished bio in the program. Uh, I just met Lori a couple days ago and uh, was uh, really uh, 
feel pretty honored to, to meet her. She participated in our training as she'll be um, the co-host for Pathways 2018 in Namibia. I'm sure she'll tell you more about that. And um, we're, we're working on some shared learning with the training. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the things that that she shared with our group is that uh, I realized that I needed to save the world to save cheetahs, and uh, I just was really fascinated by her professional journey and being um, such an impactful uh, biological conservationist. Um, you know, starting over 40 years ago with her uh, connection with cheetahs and. Um, establishing uh, a first U.S. and international captive program, one of the most su su uh, successful captive be breeding programs in North America, uh, and then partnering up with the National Zoo and the National Cancer Institute to really, um, for the first time, begin to understand the genetic variation of cheetahs that were um, contributing to their decline. And I think uh, at least a lot of the uh, very impactful conservationists that uh, are grounded in the biological sciences um, that I have met or, or know about at some point in their career recognize that, that the biology isn't enough to save the species and, and we, we have to keep getting to the why, the bigger why are these species in decline and what, um, what contribution are, are we as humans making to that. And so uh, Lori has also been incredibly impactful in trying to uh, dissect and understand and, and address that with um, working with farmers in the Namibia and local entities to really get at that and to address some of those social and economic issues that have contributed to, this, to the cheetah's decline. And I wanted to just highlight a, a couple of, of the awards that, that she's received in, in recognition of that. One is um, the Time mag Magazine's Heroes for the Planet in 2000. And then in 2010, she was awarded um, the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. And the reason that she was awarded this uh, uh, was in recognition of her work in Southwest Africa to address the social and economic needs of subsistence farmers and the work that she'd done to protect the cheetah and all of her, her important scientific work and the work that she's done to really um, affect restoring farmland and habitat. So to me that's a pretty incredible trifecta to be thinking about the people, the animals, and the places that people and animals live and the importance of understanding um, how uh, you have viable both human communities and animal communities. So please welcome Dr. Laurie Marcus. She tells us more about her work. Well, thank you all for uh, being here this morning and thank you to our sponsors of the conference, Pathways, has been a longtime friend of everybody who deals with the human dimensions. And I've been very happy to be able to work with this team um, to now start working on having Pathways come over to Namibia next January. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that, um, maybe. <laughs> um, but so. I will, I'll just tell you about Pathways Namibia, I guess, to start with. Uh, we will be having a training program. Um, the whole conference of Pathways Namibia or Pathways Africa will be the 5th of January for training through the 8th, and then the conference starts later on the 8th to the 11th of January. It's a lovely time of the year to come to Namibia and encourage everybody to come on down to Southern Africa at that time of the year. We've gotten uh, Air Namibia, our local carrier, to provide some good rates for flights. And the conference is going to be in Vintuk, which is our capital city. And um, it'll be at a Safari Court Hotel, the venue, the training program will also be going on there as well. We're trying to bring in about 60 people from throughout Africa for the training program and the trainers are going to then, after the training, go and follow and be a part of the conference as well. And I'm quite excited that I think we have at this point about 150 papers that have already 
come forward. And so it'll, we think it'll be a conference similar to all of you. But we hope um, that you'll all join us down in Southern Africa as well. So I don't know whether I should just try going forward with my slides there. Everyone can just look that way, which keeps us on time and keeps us going. I, except we sort of lost Wes. I'm not sure where he is. Um, but again, I want to thank um, everybody who puts on the, um, the Pathways conferences here. But I can just go ahead and start. Um, that my talk really is about how cheetahs and humans can share a landscape. And that's really, I think, all about wildlife in general. And in order to do that, we sort of have to make big plans. And so I'm going to talk with you about the um, kind of the problems facing the cheetah and uh, what the conflict looks like worldwide and then focus in on problems facing the cheetah and using Namibia as an example and then what some of our programs really are all about. Um, so just a bit about human wildlife conflict which we I think are all working with. Um, a definition by the World Wildlife Fund really is any interaction between humans and wildlife that results in negative impacts on human, social, economic, or cultural life and on the conservation of wildlife populations or on the environment. And from that, we know that there's examples of you know, animals that raid crops, like elephants and baboons, or livestock depredation, lions and wolves, cheetahs, humans being killed by wildlife, tigers, sharks. And just in perspective, in Namibia, we've had over 5,000 reports of human wildlife conflict just this year. And so conflict is something that I know is, you know, practitioners, we all deal with. The root causes, we've heard um, yesterday, uh, both Joel, um, um, we all talked about the problems with the human population growth. As you can see, we are at exponentially raising our populations, and we just don't have enough resources to actually maintain. But it, Africa is going to be really affected, and that middle area to the top is where the developing countries are. Our developed world is actually kind of stopping with its population growth. But Africa in the next um, about 20 years is going to double its population. Right now, half the population is under 25 years of age, and without education and lack of, of um, good jobs, reproduction just seems to always occur, and we are looking at um, a population doubling in the next 20 years in Africa alone. So kind of the context with this, we are in our sixth um, extinction, and with that, as we all know, we've got 20, you know, so many of our different mammals and birds and amphibians are now critically endangered or vulnerable and on the red um, list. And 37% of our terrestrial species are going to be lost by 2050. And there is a lot of problems with our large carnivore decline throughout the world. With that, dealing with habitat loss, the, um, killings, and the wildlife trade. In an African context, we've got you know, these guilds of carnivores and other species which are problems. And um, the low wildlife prey populations and poor health of livestock is one of our biggest problems in Africa. And it's a recipe for the trouble that we're dealing with. And poverty really makes the increasing livestock protection difficult. And livestock is both a sign of wealth as well as a status symbol throughout Africa. But what role do we as humans play in human wildlife conflict? And I'm often talking with our farming communities when people call me and say, oh, the, the cheetah or the leopard or the wild dog just killed my livestock. And I look at the livestock management and I look at it worldwide. So as I take what I know from Namibia, I've been fortunate enough to travel the world dealing with predator conflict. Livestock management is poor most places where there's conflict and that has a variety of different levels to look at. Habitat destruction, dealing with human population growth, poor rangeland management. Our migrations are being disrupted by population growth and converting our rangelands to livestock. And in an African perspective, in southern Africa, game-fenced farms. And then, of course, there is exploitation, 
trade, pets, and parts. So putting this all into perspective, I'm going to tell you kind of the cheetah story. Of course, they are the most beautiful and wonderful animal on the face of the earth. I am not partial at all. Um, they are the fastest of all the land animals, and they are the most unique of all the 37 species of cats. From that, yes, they are genetically very uniform. And our early research on this was in the early 1980s when we discovered the fact that cheetahs looked genetically similar. And we found reproductive abnormalities, and with that, we also found susceptibilities to diseases and how that really affects them, um, their adaptation, and how that's going to look at a greater risk for them environmentally and ecologically, especially as the changes are going on. So that's sort of like the basis of the last 40 years of my life. Um, they have a very um, long history. They're one of the oldest of the big cats. They um, have a, the closest re relatives of the cheetah are that of the puma and the jacarundae. They have had a long history with humans, about 5,000 years, where humans thought they were wonderful. They found them as you know, pets, kings, royalty, all had them. And with that, today, it has thinned down the population. So the cheetah is an animal that has been loved to near extinction. Um, and with that small map down there that you can't see all that well, just to say that through the genetic research that's gone on, we've now discovered that they're probably so similar that when the subspeciation that was taxonomically put out, we're now looking at redefining that genetically. Cheetahs play a very important role in the ecosystem. So they are top predator. Predators are important. We don't understand and appreciate how important predators are. But again, as I talk to the farming communities and we talk about conflict and the, the problems and the wildlife and the grasslands, um, everybody hates jackals. I think in this part of the world, everybody hates coyotes. But jackals are really neat. You know, what they are is they're nature's doctors. They're actually cleaning up all the, the carrion that's out there and the vultures. But they don't really do most of the hunting. Animals like the cheetah or the leopards do the hunting. Leopards, though, often don't share. And in Namibia and African farmers, they say, well, a leopard, you know, it only kills one animal. And I say to the farmers, but it doesn't share with everyone else. Where a cheetah, if it makes a kill, then the jackals will come in, and then they're not going to be in your goat yard trying to catch your goats and your sheep. So your jackals actually are OK, as are your cheetahs. So I spent a lot of my time looking at um, how to defend and talk about predators on a variety of different levels. Um, cheetah cubs are, um, are very special. They're very rare. We see in the wild possibly maybe 10% of any cubs really succeeding. They don't do well in protected game reserves because of lions and hyenas, which push them out um, and kill their young, steal their food. And so most of the cheetahs are found outside of protected areas. But the young are very, very vulnerable. And even today, in the illegal wildlife pet trade, people still want cheetah cubs. So the problems facing cheetahs are um, quite um, problematic. We've got habitat loss, human-wildlife conflict, which is really driven in many ways through the, the social and economic issues, because people in Africa are very, very poor. Um, the trafficking, which I mentioned, and as well as that of the, um, the inbreeding, um, effects of loss of genetic diversity, which does go back to about a 10 to 12,000 year uh, period of time where the cheetah went through a population bottleneck. But we're looking at a vortex towards extinction for the cheetah. I've been saying this now for about 40 years. They've held on 40 years. The cheetah's held on for thousands of years. It is a survivor. But today, the survival of the cheetah is in humans' hands. So although we know a lot about the, the makeup, genetics, the biology, and we keep wanting to know more, everything about the cheetah's survival is in human hands. So the, we worked hard together with uh, teams from the range-wide cheetah program, um, biologists coming together for um, probably the last 10 years, looking at what the population looks like today. We've lost about 26% of the cheetah's former range up in the left-hand corner there. The um, red is where the cheetahs were found probably in the 70s, and as we've honed in on more understanding of what the population is, the big map there of the green is where the cheetahs are found today. We're looking at about um, 2,500 individuals throughout the ranges in 31 populations. 
50% of them are in southern Africa, where Namibia and Botswana are kind of the cheetah capitals of the world. But 20 of those populations are under 100 individuals. And so that fragmentation in those small population numbers leading to what we already know about them genetically causes there to be a real problem. And most of the cheetahs are found outside of protected areas. So this causes me to have to look outside of the box and work with the people on whose land the cheetah's living. So I've pretty much traveled to most of the range countries and worked with the farming um, and biology communities throughout those areas. The last of the Asian cheetahs are up in Iran, and there's less than 50 there. Um, I live in the country of Namibia, which is in the southwest corner of um, Africa, where we again welcome you all down next year. And um, because of what we've learned today of where the population cheetahs are and how fragmented they are, today, um, working with a, a team, we put out a paper at the beginning of the year, really have now put in a petition to IUCN to actually update the cheetah to endangered. And that is uh, going to be an interesting a couple years to find out whether and how that will go forward. Because in Namibia, we still have quite a large population, possibly 2,000. Um, and, um, and I don't think that Namibia will uplist the cheetah in, in our country. But this is sort of the overview of what's going on with cheetahs. So how did I end up there? I was just from California, and I had my own little goat dairy, and I was a horseback riding person. And um, my background was in agriculture, and I was at a wildlife park where we were one of the few places in the world that had cheetahs. And I was fascinated with the cheetah and wanted to know everything about it. And so in the early 70s, really started very actively breeding cheetahs. And I ended up doing a research project that back in the 70s, you know, we all talked about taking animals back and setting them free. Well, I did a research project with a cheetah that had been born in um, at the, the park that I was at, and her name was Kayam, and I ended up in Namibia for several months, and I taught her how to hunt. Well, that was very fascinating, but what I found out from that was really that farmers were killing cheetahs. And back in the 70s, having a zoo mind, and most people really weren't traveling over into rural areas of Africa, and you didn't really think that much about conflict. And as I got there, farmers were catching cheetahs, they were trapping them, they were killing them in front of my eyes, and I really wanted to know why. But just if you look at that number in a 10-year period of time, by the time I come back to Namib from Namibia to the United States and told people that they were killing cheetahs, in a 10-year period before I packed up my bags and moved to Namibia, they killed, just in Namibia, about 7,500 cheetahs, and that is what the population of cheetahs is today. So I thought that somebody would go over to Namibia and Africa and save the cheetah if I told them all these problems. And that's not true, nobody did anything. So I actually moved to the Smithsonian and I was there for a couple years developing a program, but Namibia was not a free and independent country. And um, I didn't want to work there under the apartheid situation. And in 1990, Namibia became independent. And so I actually, from the Smithsonian, um, said to my colleagues, well, I'm going to go over to Namibia and I'm going to go save the cheetah. Now, that was in 1990, and people said to me and patted me on the head, well, aren't you a nice young lady? Um, and I basically sold my worldly possessions and got me enough money to buy a Land Rover. And so I had that Land Rover, and I spent three years driving around doing a needs assessment, and I got to meet all the farming community. And I wanted to know what the problems were facing cheetahs. Well, that kind of grew, because the farmers told me a whole lot, and I'll tell you more about that. But they basically said, oh, you should, if you like cheetahs, should come here and struggle and don't go away. And, and I said, okay, well, you know, maybe I should set down roots. So I started in on an old farmhouse, and with a small piece of land and started as a livestock farmer. And from there, now have a 100,000 acre uh, reserve where we are a working ranch. And we're open to the public as a research and education center. So that's sort of like 28 years condensed in one slide. And from there, uh, we work throughout the cheetah's range. But that gives you an idea of sort of, and I still have my old Land Rover, which I do still love. Um, but I'll tell you more about what we found in traveling around. 
Our programs, though, are, again, very, very important. We are a very solid research organization, and we've been um, tried to be the repository of everything that we can find on the generation of good science around cheetahs and their habitat. And then we're trying to look at conserving and making sure that there's enough habitat and prey so that we can ensure a stable cheetah population. And that's from Namibia and throughout the range. And then to use education to try to raise awareness within the uh, national, throughout Africa and international communities to try to save the cheetah. And our work really revolves around keeping cheetahs living in the wild. And that, and on farmlands with the farmers in a happy co coexistence together. But when you talk to farmers, and I talk to um, people throughout Africa, really everybody says, well, you know, what is the benefit of having wildlife on your land? Wildlife should be in the national park, and the government people, you should all take care of it. But the real reality is that the wildlife isn't just going to stay in the square box. And for the cheetah, it's taken me out to meet the people and talk about their problems, and then find what is that economic value of conservation? How can we actually help people who are poor have something out of wildlife and not lose their livestock to the predators and use and think of the predator like the cheetah through a different set of eyes? So coming back to the survey that I did, I went door to door. And Namibia is a big country. It's about two and a half times the size of California. In the area that are red dots there, that's where I actually went door to door and talked to the farming community. And over the years, the farmers would say, oh, I caught a cheetah. And so through the period of years, the black dots are all where the cheetahs were actually caught on the farms. And I was able to do a lot of opportunistic research, collecting blood, tissue, uh, fecals, necropsies, and we learned all about the wild cheetah. Nobody knew anything about what a wild, free-ranging cheetah looked like. So I actually was able to write the book on the health of the cheetah and what we see, and it was quite exciting. But going door to door and working with the farming community, I had to tell them what I knew about cheetahs. I learned all about their systems, but I also wanted to know if now I know about what your problems are, and you know about what the cheetah problems are, how can we actually do something together so that the cheetah can have a future? And the farmer said, well, you know, we don't know that much about the cheetah. They didn't know if it was a dog or a cat. They knew nothing about how it was living. They'd been in kind of an apartheid system for a very long period of time, very isolated, and they wanted to know more about livestock management, wildlife management, environmental education. And so in looking at that, the farmers actually wrote me and told me exactly what they needed me to do in order to actually figure out if we could learn more about the cheetah. So from that, then you needed a few good farmers. And so collecting blood on them, they got to you know help me, and we were in the middle of the bush. And then I would say, well, you know, we could learn a lot more about the cheetah if we could put a radio collar on the cat. Now this is back in the early, you know, in the well, in the early early 90s, and back in those days, they didn't have satellite collars. So we put VHF collars on, and then you know, putting the first cheetahs back out in the wild, realizing they've got huge ranges. And so this side area that I've pulled over, where all the radio um, tracking points are, really that's about a 15,000 square kilometer area. And so I ended up in an airplane twice a month, trying or twice a week, figuring out where the cheetahs were living, how they were living, whose land they were on, and then was able to share all that information with the farming communities. So that allowed us to start looking at the censusing and understanding and sharing the information with the farmers. Again, I was very interested in the biology. I wanted to know everything I could about the cheetah. And these long-term studies is, have allowed us to learn a lot. I've, now, we've had our hands on over 900 individuals. We've got a very huge database of samples as well. And we do bank our samples. And we've got a genome resource bank. Uh, we've looked at diseases, stresses. We've helped our um, captive communities understand more about the health of their cheetahs as well. We developed a genetics lab over in Namibia, continuing with the work of the, uh, the genetics. And we also bank down sperm. And that's a very important part, I think, of having our hands on um, the animals. But farmers were catching cheetahs, and I wanted to know why they were catching cheetahs, really. And was it because they were losing their livestock? 
um, you know, you're catching 7,000 cheetahs in 10 years, you know, eight, 900 cheetahs a year. Are you, really, are you really losing your livestock? And the farmers basically said no. It's a perceived threat. And so, you know, 97% of the farmers said, no, we don't, we're really not losing them. Um, but out of what we found out, we found there was about a 3% livestock loss. And we did this using scat samples. And so I was able to collect scat samples around, plus understanding when they were catching the cheetahs, and they usually catch them at these marking trees, um, understanding what kind of losses there were. So I was able to actually work with the farmers and ferret out what a lot of these different problems became. But with that, it allowed us again to put collars on the cats and then sharing with the farming community what kind of home ranges these animals were having. Now these white um, squares, each one of these is one of a, a, a commercial farm. They're about um, 10,000 acres each. And so we're finding that Cheetah's home range is recovering about 20 farms or 1,500 square kilometers in their movement. And it was just you know, huge, the, the area that was going on. And then, but they, through our continued research using camera traps as well, we were able to find out that they're living in a very low density. So only about two to 12 cheetahs per about 1,000 um, square kilometers. So this has been very interesting for the farmers to understand that, and they've now started to learn a lot more about the cheetahs, looking at them through our eyes. But out of this, really, in sharing this then, not only with the Namibia, but we helped develop programs in Botswana, and up in East Africa, and Kenya, and Tanzania, up in Algeria, and Iran, we know that cheetahs have very, very huge home ranges and large landscapes, and they're not national parks because of the conflicts with the lions and hyenas. And so we then had to take what we know from our research and put it into that of conservation. And I started to look at the farmers with their, their livestock. They usually didn't have dogs, there was no herders. The livestock was being you know, picked off early in the morning and the afternoons, the period of time that the predators were around. And so coming from Oregon back in the, um, the 70s, the Livestock Guarding Dog programs had just started, and so I'd watched that in Oregon around our, um, our coyote and sheep farmers, and I thought, you know, I think these livestock guarding dogs might work. And so I started a program in the early 90s, and we brought Anatolian Shepherd and Kangle dogs into Namibia. And it has allowed us now to work very closely with the farming communities. And we breed and we place the dogs with the farmers, and we've got them throughout most of the, the country. Now, Kangle and Anatolian dogs are pretty interesting. There are about 25 different breeds of guarding dogs. But we use this breed. It's got about a 6,000-year history protecting the flocks against the wolves and the bears in Turkey. But they live in a high plateau, so it's very hot. And so we chose this dog because it has a short hair coat. Um, they are very adaptable to the kinds of conditions that we are in Namibia, very, very arid. Our herds travel very far. But an interesting point about this breed of dog is they're an independent thinker. Now, most of the farmers have their livestock. They put them out. They don't think about them. They bring them back, and they go, something took them. And this breed of dog basically says, I think you as a human are a little bit smarter than the goat and sheep, but you really aren't very smart, so just let me handle it. So, you know, you can feed me, but basically it's an independent thinker, and they work on their own. And I've just found that fascinating, and after now, we've bred and placed about um, 550 of these dogs since in about a 20-year period of time. But we manage this program very carefully. We um, do um, spay and neuter the puppies when they are about eight weeks of age, and then we place them when they're about 10 weeks of age. And then from this, we've monitored these dogs from the time they are placed with the farmers throughout their entire life. And it's allowed us to have a huge amount of, um, of data. And we are constantly making sure that the farmers know more. And with this training program in a 20-year period of time, and that many dogs out there, we've gotten a lot of farmers not just protecting their livestock, but having better health care and knowledge about what's going on. And our long-term study has really looked at, you know, are they bonding to the livestock? They mark their territory, you know, how they, they, they bark very loudly, they 
Will they chase the prey? Do they kill prey if, or the, the predator if needed? And yes, they will. So it's not necessarily non-lethal, but it is in, it's very discriminant in making sure that the predators are away. And predators don't want to be near um, the livestock because the dogs are barking very loudly and predators actually want to just kind of stay away. And so the marking of the territory becomes very, very important. So over the years that we've uh, placed the dog, and so again, this has been a long-term study, we've been able to actually track about 440 of the dogs over their lifetime. And we've found that they're, you know, 86% of them say that they're working good to excellent, which is what we want, and how we track them by going and looking at them. But 92% of them have seen an economic benefit. With the 72% reduction in livestock loss, and 48% of them have gone from livestock loss to no livestock loss. So we have like a two year waiting list for the dogs. And not only are they protecting the cheetah, we've found that we are protecting the jackals, the leopards, as well as the wild dogs and all the other smaller predators as well. And the farming communities have, um, are taking ownership and care of the dogs. So it's been a very, very successful program and we're now putting the dogs with cattle as well. But this has allowed me to go into another aspect because I've had to have lots of dogs um, and with those dogs um, we have to have goats and so I used to have and do still have a lot of meat goats and I thought you know you have to breed your goats, you get them two year old then you send them out and you have to eat them and I kind of like them because they're with the puppies. And so I said why don't we find something new and, and I used to be a dairy goat farmer and I thought well, we should use dairy goats in Namibia. Nobody's done that in Namibia. And so I started a small herd and with that developed a creamery, which is called the Dancing Goat Creamery. And what we've now done is the process of teaching people how to take care of the dogs, take care of their goats, start looking at maybe having an alternative food source of milk, caring properly for that. And we've kind of developed these skill transfers. We teach people how to make cheeses, and you can make cheese even in a rural area without having um, refrigeration. So the dogs have uh, created a whole new system for us as well. I also want to point out that we have developed a eco-label um, that we work very closely with. We try to mark all of our products everywhere we work with a product of Cheetah Country, which is one. And then we helped a program start up called Certified Wildlife Friendly. And I'll talk more about that as well. But that now has been, um, it's a certified program trying to work with people like myself, people like the snow leopard people, people who are working with a, um, a species in need working with people. And so our products being certified wildlife friendly are basically saying that this product is helping people live in harmony with that species that is, um, is vulnerable or endangered. Um, habitat and prey are critical to predators. Um, well, the habitat is critical to the prey and to the livestock, and you have to have prey if you are a predator. And those are concepts that, hmm, I think worldwide, we still can't wrap our head around. We see the elk out here, and um, with the elk, someplace there's got to be mountain lions, I'm sure. Um, there's a place in, um, in Seattle that I always like to tell the story of is they build a whole community um, in the northern part of Seattle and they wondered on the golf course why the elk were going through every year, the migration pattern they put right on the golf course. And then they wondered, well, why were the um, mountain lions coming in? And the wildlife biologists actually went to the, you know, the college or the high schools and got a bunch of high school kids in and the high school kids went and said, well, people who built the city, um, you built your golf course right in this migratory route. And um, so it's not necessarily the problem of the, the elk and the mountain lion, it's how your city planning is. So planning is really a problem that we all have in understanding what the needs are for these animals, and yet then it also becomes a problem. In Namibia, we're very famous for um, a program which are called conservancies, and this came about right after our um, independence um, in Namibia in the early 1990s. And this was because in Namibia we actually have integrated land use. 
where it's different than what most farming people, ranchers, think of. You think of wildlife in your national parks and ranch land where I have my animals. In Namibia, 80% of our wildlife is living on private lands. And so with this, these conservancies actually support an integrated system, that of having wildlife and managed livestock. So the concept has been wonderful and for the last um, 20 years to try to grow this concept. In Namibia, 40% of our country is in private conservancy hands. Either like the brown areas there, um, communal conservancies, and communal conservancies are, I, I always say, sort of like Indian reservations. At the apartheid time, the different peoples um, um, were put into these different brown areas, and that was the, the, the west was Dahmer land, the east is Herero land, um, we end up with the Bambu land. These green areas are our national parks, and as I said, only about 20% of our wildlife are in those national parks. In Namibia, um, there are less than 100 cheetahs living in national parks. So 90% of all of our cheetahs are found outside of national parks. This area here are commercial conservancies, and then these are our communal conservancies. So what we have found with this, um, there's now over 80 conservancies. This is dealing with uh, about 250,000 people and trying to get the value of wildlife to actually assist the people instead of just having a livestock economic. Um, and we have both consumptive and non-consumptive, so ecotourism, but also hunting. And what we do with the conservancy is we don't want game fences. And these game fences, as I said, stop migrations. And then our wildlife is free, and so our wildlife is actually able to migrate and move. And in an arid environment, this is important. So what we've seen in Namibia is actually a real increase in our wildlife numbers. And this has allowed us to understand a lot more about um, also where the predators are moving as well. But from this, I want to talk about the habitat issues, because there's been a lot of grazing land um, here. And Grazing started, livestock started um, around 150 years ago. The Europeans came in prior to that. The um, Africans had their livestock and they'd move because there was no water because of the rains. So they'd move and migrate with their livestock. But the um, farmers started putting in boreholes and they you know, kept their livestock in one place. But it's in a very arid landscape. We ended up with um, a lot of um, droughts every 10 years, very heavy droughts. And the landscape was overgrazed by a lot of the livestock. And so in about a 60 to 70 year period, we've gone from an open habitat here into this thick and thorn bush. And here about half of our country now is so thickly thorn bush that it has reduced the grazing capacity, not only for the livestock, but also for the wildlife. And that became a real problem as I started talking to the farmers because I'd say, you know, what are your problems? And they'd say, well, you know, this bush encroachment. And I'll just go kill any predators there are because I can kill predators where I can't get rid of that bush. And so I ended up getting involved in habitat restoration because farmers were killing more predators in this thick bushed area as well. So we started looking at how we could actually restore that habitat. And if we had more habitat, as our founding president of Namibia said, who was our international patron for 25 years, that if you have more habitat, you can have more grass. If you have more grass, you can have more wildlife. And then you can have more cheetahs. So that's the point, and we started restoring the habitat, and we got about 10 tons per hectare. And we're doing this all through a Forest Stewardship Council certification program, which allows us to take about a 70% harvest. And everything that we're doing is done looking at the biodiversity. So understanding ongoing biodiversity. Are there more birds coming in, more wildlife coming in, more insects? You know, how does this all look? Um, and so we then figured out well, if you take this, and so it's kind of developing a, you know, a, a timber business, which I didn't know that I was going to do, but coming from Oregon, I thought, you know, all those chip trucks going up. I bet, you know, if you take that bush and you could chip it and then make something of it, it would be maybe a value. And so we looked around and we found out that you could like make these fuel logs 
And so this is an extruder process. And I now have got like over 40 some employees that we make a eco fuel log. And so it burns with high heat, low emissions, uh, but it's very, very heavy. And so then we started working with the EU and we came up now with, a, this is like a green charcoal retort. And if you know how horrible charcoal is to the world and to Africa, and I wish I could tell you more about charcoal, that I don't like it. Um, we have now tried to look at, um, at putting it into something, you know, it, there's no emissions going out with this retort. And so this is a new thing that we're looking at at this point, which I don't want to talk that much about it, but I'm also looking at going into biomass energy. And that to me is going to be something that's really important because you can actually burn the biomass and make um, energy in these small villages. We could potentially power small villages. So we now have at our center, this is a, a, a kind of a biomass technology demonstration area. And so we've got university students, engineering students coming in, and we're all looking at aspects of how to use this biomass in a different way. We're looking at bush to feed, but um, this has been a very interesting project going on. So labeling, as I'd mentioned early on, I think is really important. So at the same time as I was looking at this bush harvesting, and um, I ended up, uh, this is about 15 years ago, realizing that there's a few cartels out there in the world. I don't know if anyone else thinks that there are cartels, but there's two that I think are quite important. One's in the wood industry, um, and forestry and charcoal, and the other one's in meat. And um, I thought, well, you know, we've got good farmers out there. They've actually been working very hard to um, live in harmony with cheetahs. They, they like me. They like the cheetah. They've learned a lot. You know, these farmers and their conservancy members should actually be getting more money for their beef. It is predator friendly, it's free range, it's grass fed, it's lovely. So I developed a whole eco label and worked on this for a number of years and um, called it Cheetah Country Beef. This evolved with our meat industry to become nature's friendly. We have a EU export, we've just got a US export. And I never got my label actually um, um, to the market, but um, we're looking at the same concept around, you know, dolphin friendly. But the model that we looked at was by having a 60 cent, uh, which is in Namibia, six cent, 60s, it's about six US cents per um, kg, more to the farmers. We just have a model to show that um, our price premiums, by diff putting different price premiums, could have an exponential rate of growth for the farmers to get more money on their land. But with that, it had to be tied into good ecosystem stewardship. So I've now changed my model and my label, which I don't have designed yet, but I want it to be an ecosystem stewardship meat. And I don't want it to just be beef, it can be lamb, it can be um, goats. And if we can do this with a price premium, you need to have a third party certification. And from that, um, it's taken a few years, but just as I left Namibia a few days ago, having a meeting with the NAU, which is the Namibia Agriculture Union, um, along with um, several of the other NGOs, are looking at the effects of um, overgrazing of the land and bush encroachment and game fenced farms going up and stopping the migration. And they came back and they said, we know you've worked hard on this label. Help us bring it forward again. So from this model, we had a bunch of people from the United States, WWF brought people from the prairie lands um, over to uh, Namibia to start looking at what our conservancy models were looking at and meeting our farmers that were living with predators. And they came back here and they put the predator friendly beef into effect. And I'm now looking at working with them to sell our meat through an ecosystem stewardship price premium here through them to get a premium from um, maybe the US market that can pay our farmers for them to be doing good farming management at the same time not killing predators. In my big picture, I think that consumers globally could become the ones that were helping guide how our stewardship of our ecosystems can function. So that's actually the big picture that I can go out of business. 
I'm not ready to go out of business yet, um, because there's still a lot of rural communities. And this is one of the areas that we work in. So um, um, our base is right here, and um, this is what's called the Waterberg Conservancy. This is the Waterberg, which is a national park, and this is the Herrero land um, community. And this area has about 23,000 uh, people and um, several million head of livestock. It's very overgrazed. But it also is areas where our wild dogs are, cheetahs are, and also our rhinos, black and white rhinos. And the vision for this community as we started working together um, a number of years ago, now maybe 15 years ago, and there's no livestock on the, or wildlife on the land, they're cattle farmers in this very rural area. But they really said, we want to have a balanced ecosystem with humans and their livestock benefiting both directly and indirectly by the integration of wildlife. And with that, then that could stop some of the conflict that was going on and the killing of the wild dogs, which are um, critically endangered species, only about 4,500 of them left in the world. We have about 450 in Namibia, as well as that of the cheetahs, and to get the communities to benefit by having these wildlife on their lands. So we went in in 2012 and again did a needs assessment. And so I like to talk to people. I want to know what they do, what they think, you know, what's happening with them, and why do they have a problem, and creatively can we come up with some um, solutions. So the high density of livestock, and this map actually shows this is where most all the people are, heavy, heavy livestock, cattle, goats, and sheep, overgrazed, leading to bush encroachment, which has reduced their grazing, very, very low wildlife numbers, no wonder there's conflict, poverty, really bad, everybody lives on their livestock, which is all poor and who looks horrible, and then um, we wanted to know by talking with them, we could find out where the problem animals were so we could actually work with them. And then we came up with, the, with them an aim of what this capacity building program with them could look like if we wanted their vision to come true. And we wanted to first reduce the human wildlife conflict and them killing the, the predators, but also they asked, they wanted training in rangeland management, it was overgrazed, integrated livestock and wildlife and predator management, livestock health, which is really critical. So they're like, you know, two hours, you know, two days from a veterinarian. Veterinarians don't have a lot of, you know, maybe the drugs available for them. They don't have enough money for the drugs. And then they thought, you know, we can do something. Well, how about developing like a craft or retail business? So we tried to come up with a few businesses that could help the people as well. Well, an uh, easy one that came forward was uh, from some of the, the ladies uh, that they were very creative and they started making jewelry. And then I said, well, okay, why can't I then label that? and brand it, and maybe I can get the zoo's stores to buy the jewelry and connect it back to the wild dogs and the cheetahs and the people who are living on that land. That hasn't fully worked, but we do have our marketing strategies to get our products into the communities, but the women are having their own money. Now, Herrera women, which are the, what these women are in their long dresses, um, are hmm, not very well respected by the Herrera men. And from that, uh, being a woman in a woman's organization, the women have learned a lot about standing on their own, having their own money, how to do things. So over almost a 30 year period of time, I think I've been a pretty good role model for a lot of the women. But now we're trying to get economy back into them. Last year alone, we put about 20,000 US dollars into buying their crafts and distributing and selling those. Um, our future Farmer of Africa training programs are what has actually evolved. And um, I was an FFA, Future Farmer America, um, person. You know, I'm an old livestock person forever and ever. And so FFA, to me, sounded great. And so we started training farmers. And over the years, we've put through about 8,000 rural farmers through training programs. That would be a week at a time, 25 people at a time, through our training center, teaching them about livestock management, wildlife management, habitat restoration. And then we went into a very, very condensed uh, one-year um, program where we took 2,000 people and we were with them every single month in their villages. So we went out to the villages and we worked directly with them for an entire year. A lot of practicals, a lot of sitting around underneath the, um, the uh, trees, which is where in Africa a meeting is always under a tree. 
Um, but we were able to look at a, a lot of the different problems that they had. Everything is in Herero, so we have Herero teachers. For a Dahmer land, we have Dahmer teachers. Um, interesting things, you know, how do you trim your goat's hooves? Uh, any of you goat hoof trimmers? Well, good. And cattle hoof trimmers. Well, if you don't have your, if you've got limping animals, they're going to be at the end of your herd, and they're actually the ones that get picked off really quickly. Just a very simple note on livestock management. But the farmers have learned a lot. But we did pre and post evaluations. We really wanted to know what they looked like before, how it was going through the courses, and especially this one year long course that we were with these people constantly for a year, and then evaluating what was going on with them. It gave us time to actually look at also questioning about when they saw predators, where they saw them, was it regularly, um, where, which ones were they? We were able to work with these farming communities and start putting out camera traps in the areas, and that allowed them to start learning about the predators that are on their land. Remember, there's no wildlife really in this area, so there's not a lot for these predators to be catching. Um, but the farmers were losing livestock. So 93% of the farmers that we worked with had lost in a year about 4,500 head of livestock. I mean, that's a lot of livestock loss. And, you know, the, of course, everybody thinks, oh, it's predators, you know? And, well, you know, well, you know, was there theft? How much of that? There was there poisonous plants, predators? Well, we found out there was 40% of it was to predators. But look at that amount, just the, you know, starvation from the drought occurring. And uh, disease aspects and poisonous plants were taking their toll as well. And so those were the things that we could fix easier than that of just that of the livestock loss. But then we looked at, well, which were the predators taking what animals? We found that the wild dogs were the ones that were catching the cattle, the calves primarily. Um, and out of that, we found that the wild dogs actually had caught about 365 cattle for the year. Well, a wild dog pack will eat on a daily basis, and a cow looks good for a family of wild dogs. But um, the wild dogs, though, with that, we found, though, that these farmers, although they had all those losses, they were only, you know, killing. 88% of the people were actually doing any killing. So they had learned a lot. They didn't want to kill. And then we'd been talking for years about the use of the wildlife for ecotourism and the cultural value of their lands. And they said, yeah, you know, we think that, you know, cheetahs and wild dogs really could be a, an important economic aspect through ecotourism. Some of the other results that we found, the pre-workshop, we found that 97% of the farmers had limited knowledge in how to care for their livestock or their rangeland. 97, I bet, I bet that's be, if none of you are farmers, would be probably most of you. I'd put all of you out on a farm, give you a few goats and hope that you could care for them. You'd probably say you don't know what to do. After our workshops, we found that 99% of them had a greater knowledge. This is working very closely with them. Again, I've dealt with close to 8,000 people. What we found from our pre and post surveys was 64% of the losses could be actually attributed to and stopped through good livestock health management. And that right there allowed us to then start looking at that other 40% of the problems. 94% said that their health, their livestock was healthier after the workshops and that 70% have developed resources. Remember, these are poor people. That means they have to find resources to get vaccines, to have reduced their stock numbers, to reduce their grazing. And 70% had done that. But then we started going door to door. We developed a scorecard for the farmers to go out there and find out, you know, really? We, you came to our workshop, we now are gonna score you with your livestock. Um, how's your herd health? And so we have a veterinarian that's full time out in this communal area looking at the health of the livestock. We've um, developed kind of a one health program. We've had several students from different veterinarian schools come and work with us looking at the use of vaccines and supplements. But we still find that their corrals and their facilities are not very, very good which allows us then to continue looking at that conflict areas. So again, going door to door, working with the people, these are where livestock losses has occurred. These are where our hot spots are. So now we start focusing in on those hot spots. That's where the wild dogs are and the cheetahs are and the leopards and what can we do to help those farmers in particular. And 
so that's sort of where we're at today. Um, we are working on those hot spots. We're trying to reduce the losses to the wild dogs. Um, Ochibarongo is the town that we're based in. And when I started there in Ochibarongo, um, you know, people said, we hate cheetahs, we hate you. Take all the cheetahs back to America. Um, now, Ochibarongo, actually, they just put this new welcome sign up. We have and are called the cheetah capital of the world. We've got a cheetah on the sign, we've got our lovely kudu, of course we love our goats and sheep, um, and we actually have, continue to monitor the work that we do, but our economic impact assessment going back into the community looks to be at about 10 million US dollars per year for the activities that we have, people coming to the center, the rollover of the people that uh, we're working with, and today we have over 100 employees, and I still have my lovely old Land Rover. Just a very quick overview about what's happening with some of the other populations. Um, we have a very big problem going on with illegal wildlife trafficking, and this is taking us into a lot of work in um, East Africa, and we're seeing about uh, 300 cubs a year being taken off of this very small and very, very vulnerable populations. And so that area, there's just been a workshop in Somaliland with one of our colleagues from um, Colorado State here and my uh, team from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And we've developed a team in Somaliland who are now a rescue center for cheetah cubs that are being trafficked, being caught, and now setting up a rehab center, we hope, in Somaliland. We've helped set one up in Ethiopia and there's one in Djibouti, but we're trying to stop this trafficking over to the Middle East. So that's again taking a lot of our work, but that came forward at the CITES conference last September. But for every one cheetah cub that goes into the trafficking, we lose about five cubs, just because they're so vulnerable, they die, they get sick. And so the team of us working on this all together um, and working with not only the um, cat specialist group and that of the range-wide um, cheetah and wild dog conservation program, we're working hard to not only stop the impacts of the illegal trafficking, but we're working throughout the cheetah's range to try to grow our populations. Now, um, this, the last couple of years, we've been working on a definitive book on cheetahs, and this is ready to come out in December. It's called Cheetahs, Biology and Conservation. And we pulled together uh, the world's leading experts, um, and there's uh, 40 um, chapters in the book, so if you want to learn more about many of the different things that I've talked about in my talk, you can get the book. It's an Elsevier book, and we're excited. It will relieve me from um, the amount of overwork and my other two co-editors, both um, Lorraine and Anne, uh, who've worked very hard with me over the last two to three years with this book. And finalizing, just to again say, please come down to Namibia, to our pathways. It's called Living with Wildlife. Namibia, we think, has figured out a way to live with wildlife. And although we have small populations and vast areas, we still have conflict. But the economic value and the alternative livelihoods, we think can, from Namibia, help change the way Africa is going with its wildlife today. I am still looking for support for trainers, training. We um, have another 20 um, trainees from throughout Africa that have been selected, but we need the funds for it. Each trainee needs about $1,500 to come to the training program and go through the conference. And then the conference is available. So if anybody knows a way that would like to sponsor one of the trainees to the workshop, please do let us know. Um, Namibia is full of wildlife. January is the most wonderful time to come and visit. Um, all of our wildlife has been giving birth at that point in time. Atasha, our national park, is um, full of wildlife and it is um, a lovely place. So come down and join us and thank you for letting me share the cheetah story with you because cheetahs and humans, um, we have to find a way for them to share a landscape. If not, the cheetah might not be around um, in the next 20 years. And for me, that's not an acceptable option. And so I do need to keep changing the world. Thank you very much. So 
So uh, there's probably a minute or two for a question, but I'll also be around and can answer questions. Yes. That blew my mind. <laughs> wow, talk about doing everything. Uh, really impressive. You touched on it, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the role of the federal government in Namibia. Is it helpful? Is it indifferent? Or is it uh, hurtful? That's, thank you. That Our government, um, and I've been very proud to be there since its independence and watching the government grow. And um, it's been interesting because setting everything up has gone from a Southern African system into making our own Namibian system. And um, in a is time flies. Um, I'm very, very proud of what our, our federal government actually has done. And um, it's a very trying hard to put the responsibility of the wildlife into the hands of the people. And with that, our laws really are such that if you have um, the wildlife on your land, you can actually utilize it. And by developing the conservancies, then the communities can utilize it as well. And so the government has been a empowering and trying to develop, instead of owning it, trying to say, it's yours if you manage it. And we will teach you how to manage through conservancy initiatives, game counts, proper permitting. And from that, um, I believe that that is one of the success stories in Africa, is that our government is so strong with the value of our wildlife. We're trying to go from more into a wildlife economy, I would say. So thank you. Okay. Well, I just had one other quick question about the habitat restoration. When you remove the bush, then are you replanting with something else, or is it naturally go back into? The grass will come back. So the bush actually um, sh shades everything underneath, and also each one of those bushes drinks about 65 liters of water a day. So there is a desertification aspect as well. And um, so by removing it, then the grasses do restore. And then what we're trying to do through, again, and I believe it's through certification, is to not have the overgrazing of the land again. So that's why we're all now pushing for this ecosystem certification meet. So I'm, I'm going to hold on to that, because then we can keep these um, rangelands open again and manage them, and then we'll have this whole balance of wildlife, managed livestock, good predators, ecotourism, sustainable use, and then the meat does feed everybody as well. So our wildlife has got a variety of value. Um, how is your program uh, actually achieved as in Iran? Well, I've, I've done a lot of training, so we've trained about um, 40 people from Iran down at our center. And there, it's very scary. The populations are only about 50 animals. Um, the government is committed to it, but a lot of the problems are is the wildlife, the livestock has gone into the game reserves where the livestock is. They've got livestock guarding dogs. They protect the livestock so they're Cheetahs don't have much prey. The prey gets pushed away. So they're trying to buy out the herders to get them out of the game reserves so that they can restock, get the wildlife numbers back up and the cheetah numbers back up. But again, when you think of maybe 40 or 50 individuals, um, we are talking kind of on a genetic component. And with those other 20 populations being under 100 individuals, we should and could and have the uh, knowledge to maybe start assisting maybe with uh, population recovery uh, genetically, but those are political issues that people don't want to talk about. So those are one of the things that I think we need to push is to talk about, you know, does it matter if, you know, the Iranian cheetah looks just very similar to all the others, they aren't separated by very much genetically, how are we going to augment some of these populations? Lori, could you talk briefly about how livestock is managed in, in uh, or, uh, how grazing is managed in, in these conservancies? And I'm, I'm just interested in how they're incentivizing people to have, to actually keep wild ungulates on the landscape as opposed to replacing them with livestock. Well, it used to be in the 1960s, the farms were for sale wildlife free because there was no value to have the wildlife. So the farmers killed them all off. And that's why this overgrazing took over. All the cattle and sheep and goats were out there. 
And then in the 70s, the governments brought back the fact that if you have wildlife on your land, you can utilize it. That then started a utilization of you know, trophy hunting, um, own use, and people love their wildlife. And that's why our wildlife numbers have increased. But um, then you have to look at this rangeland management. And that's why today, through like the agriculture unions, we're all looking at this problem of bush encroachment, overgrazing, habitat restoration, and then the value of the wildlife and how to put better value on the livestock so you need less of it. So it's the rangeland management has been a very severe problem for all these years. Thank you. Yeah. That's my story. <laughs> Well, Lori, thank you so much. I think to say that you're a trailblazer in conservation seems quite an understatement. And I think uh, as a female uh, doing this work in conservation, uh, you certainly serve as a role model for more than just the Herrera women. <laughs> so thank you for the science that you bring, the partnerships, the collaboration, uh, and, and just all the incredible work that you've done to really embrace the, the social and the biological context for these beautiful creatures. So on behalf of the conference for your time and all you've done for conservation, we want to present you with this photograph that is uh, done by David Clack. He's a uh, Colorado photographer and this is actually on Colorado Slate. Great. And a picture in Colorado, I believe this is Hallett's Peak in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, just nearby. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes the plenary. Uh, again, the uh, special session for Dr. Stephen Keller. Uh, get those addendums uh, in the lobby here and uh, Enjoy the day.